Hey everyone, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Short selling is basically when you bet that the stock market or a specific stock will fall. This is basically like portfolio insurance, but you can also make a serious amount of money doing short selling strategies. For example, short selling has been in the news so much recently from the Reddit short squeeze in which retail investors like you guys took on a major hedge fund that was shorting GameStop and actually won. And this resulted in a YouTuber named Roaring Kitty having to testify at Congress after making millions of dollars. And then we also have the major hedge fund short by the great Bill Ackman, who actually shorted corporate credit during the global health crisis of 2020. And he actually turned $27 million into $2.6 billion. So these are some serious gains that people can get by doing a short position. But bear in mind there is an immense risk because the risk profile is actually flipped in reverse for short selling stocks. For example, the losses can effectively be unlimited unless you do some sort of reverse hedging. But either way, in this video, I'm going to dive into an interview by Jim Chanos, who's a billionaire short selling legend. I'm gonna to reveal to you guys Jim Chanos's top five short selling strategies. But before we dive right in, if you're new around here, feel free to join the investing family by hitting that subscribe button and turning that notification bell on. And if you do find any value in this video at all, feel free to give it a big thumbs up that helps out tremendously with the channel. And with that being said, let's dive in. Perhaps explain to us why short selling is, uh, why is it different? Like why is it not just a mirror image of buying a stock? So I, I often, when I started out, I thought that was the case. I thought that the, the research process, if you're a fundamental short seller, should be the same as if you're any investor, value investor, um, growth investor. You should be analyzing the company, its prospects, its valuation. But there are a lot of asymmetries with the short side to the long side, um, not least of which is the need to borrow the shares. The tax treatment in many jurisdictions is different. The biggest one that I've realized over time is really more rooted in behavioral finance. Everybody in this room has been the beneficiary of what we would call positive reinforcement cycles in your life. Yet study after study has shown that most rational people's ability to make decisions correctly uh, breaks down in an environment of constant negative reinforcement. Um, the ultimate example of which would be, say, for example, an interrogation where your ability to withhold information is is compromised by the interrogation techniques. Um, if you think about Bay Street or Wall Street, or whatever, they are giant positive reinforcement machines. I mean, they exist to basically sell securities, uh, raise capital, and correctly so. Um, but when you are a short seller, I wake up every morning and I look at my Bloomberg or my iPad, and I can be sure that of the 60 stocks we're short globally, probably 10 to 15 have some sort of news. Someone recommending the stock, someone upping an earnings estimate, CEO on CNBC, takeover rumor. And 99% of the time, it's just noise. But it's always there. It's sort of the music of the investment business, as I call it. It's the elevator music, always on in the background. If you are a short seller, that is, I said, just constant negative reinforcement. You're constantly being told you're wrong. And for most people, that becomes difficult over time. It becomes a life too short, life's too short kind of, kind of situation. And so I've sort of changed my view on this. I think most good short sellers at the end of the day are born, not made. I think that you have to have that constitution to just sort of drown that out and understand when the informational content is real and when you have to pay attention to that noise, but also when you can drown it out and just go with the courage of your convictions and your own work um, and your conclusions based on that work. So I think that there is, there is a fundamental difference between the two sides of the market. Um, I've seen a lot more stocks go to zero than infinity, right? So <laughs> there, is, there is that reality of, of, of the situation. And number two, People think too discreetly, Mo, about their short ideas um, for lots of, again, these behavioral finance reasons. Um, and, and for us, it, it's a portfolio, just as it is for the long side. I mean, we have domestically 40 names, globally 60 names. Um, every idea is 1% to 2% on average. 
3%, 4% if we really love something. Um, and so no one idea is going to take us out of the ball game um, because of portfolio management and risk management, even if we love something. Uh, to, to not bring up a bad name in Canada, but Valiant Pharmaceuticals, which was one of our big successes in the past 18 months, doubled on us first from, from 130 to 260. And we actually were covering stock above 200, even though we loved the idea to keep it within our risk parameters and adding to it back below 200 and even below 100 as the news got worse. So it, it's like anything else. I mean, you have to dynamically risk adjust your portfolio every single day, not just sit there and, uh, and, and let things go up. In the America Online example, um, America Online went up eightfold on us. It probably cost us over two years about 5% in total performance. So that's because it was never much more than three quarters of 1% or 1% position. We had a number of internet names on in the late 90s that we thought were accounting frauds. And, and so we just kept trimming it back, even though we liked it. It kept going against us until even we got sick of it. But it was, it was never a position, despite the fact that it was up so much, that would ever imperil the portfolio. <laughs> Consistency is down through time. Some themes that we've seen in the portfolio, not that we look for themes, but, but uh, where we've seen our best ideas reside. Um, one would be booms that go bust. Um, and by that, we have kind of a tight definition. Um, we call booms that go bust any credit-driven asset inflation where the cash flow of the asset being purchased with debt does not service the debt. So it's kind of a long-winded way of saying that the dot-com aspect of the late 90s didn't interest us as much as the telecom build-out part of the late 90s, where people, the Nortels and the Lucents, and, and the, were building out the networks and spending a lot of money. Um, real estate bubbles tend to interest us, because toward their end, people borrow money to buy houses or commercial properties that don't service the debt incurred to purchase them. Um, and then again, you have a whole country in East Asia right now that is the epitome of this idea of just borrowing more and more money to, to finance its economic model. Another area would be technological obsolescence, where we've seen time and time again, particularly in the last 20 years with the advent of the internet, on how businesses that seemingly had unassailable moats um, found their business models completely compromised by changes in technology. And, and there, the, the general concept is, is the companies are not depreciating their capital bases fast enough to offset the technological risks to their business and find themselves um, in deep trouble after five or six or seven years. So think of companies like Kodak or Blockbuster Video or a myriad of companies, that, the, record industry, the record store industry, that have just been decimated by digitization. Um, a third area would be uh, companies that grow by acquisition. Um, it is one of the last great legal areas of fraud, um, <laughs> where companies are very aggressive in the way they uh, allocate their purchase prices and play all kinds of games quite legally um, in, in melding other companies into themselves. And we find this over and over and over again, so-called roll-ups. Um, number four would be consumer fads, where we've just seen people get completely enamored with one product type companies and forecast sort of hockey stick like growth. Products themselves sow the seeds of their own demise as they increasingly saturate um, a consumer market. So think of things like Cabbage Patch Dolls, George Foreman Grills, Nordic Tracks. Um, I could go on and on and on. I like George Foreman's. <laughs> and, then and then finally, anytime we can sell a dollar for $2, in some sort of classic arbitrage, where we see uh, one security trading here and the ability to short an affiliated security or a spinoff or something like that because of, uh, of some crazy market situation, we'll try to take advantage. The classic example there were the closed end country funds. When the Berlin Wall went down in 89, for some reason, Japanese investors got enamored with the idea that Europe would have this new renaissance. So they ended up 
bidding up the values of the New York Stock Exchange closed-end country funds of, say, the Spain fund, the Italy fund, the Germany fund, which held large publicly traded liquid securities to 300% of NAV. So, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it, was, it was an amazing short sale until it went to 400% of NAV. <laughs> you know, so again, you kind of, you know, uh, and, and, and then some of them maybe went to 500% of NAV. Now, luckily, the squeeze was short because Wall Street and Bay Street being what they are, decided to come out with the new Spain fund and the new Germany fund and the, the new Italy fund um, to fulfill the demand of insatiable Japanese investors to buy stocks at four times what they were trading on the exchange. And uh, the, uh, the arbitrage collapsed. But anytime we can do that, of course, we'll do that. So. so I hope you guys found this video valuable. My personal favorite quote by him was that I've seen more stocks go to zero than go to infinity. Which is your favorite part of this interview by Jim Chanos? What is your favorite short selling strategy? Which stocks do you think could potentially be shorted right now? I'd love to hear your thoughts, guys. So please do comment those below. And if you did find value in this video, feel free to give it a big thumbs up that helps out tremendously with the channel if you haven't subscribed yet feel free to join the investing family by hitting that subscribe button and turning that notification bell on and if you're curious on what could be the next big short i actually did another video on this where i discussed a billionaire investing thesis and he discussed what could be the next big short so if you wish to check that out i'll leave a link for that video in the description below if you're curious with that being said, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see you in my next video. Invest safe.